Hey everybody, welcome to the Gagno Atelier. I'm your old pal, Tim Gagno, and today we are gonna be talking about the scariest, the most intimidating thing that any artist that has ever artists in the history of artists has ever had to endure. That's right, the scary thing that we are talking about today is the critique. That's right, the critique. It is terrifying, it is scary, it is making yourself vulnerable to another person, but it is also the single most fundamental and important aspect of skill growth as an artist that you can do, both for yourself and as you go up in the ranks as an artist, it's one of the highest honors that you can be given is to critique somebody else. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk not only about how to get a critique, how to receive a critique, but we're also gonna be talking about how to give a critique. So today's Gagno Atelier vlog is entitled How to Give and Receive a Critique. It's pretty exciting, I know. So with that said in mind, before we get started, if you like content like this and you like the content that the Gagno Atelier is putting on, um, please, if you're seeing this on Facebook, like the post, share the post, go to the Gagno Atelier Facebook page and hit the like button. Please do that. If you're watching us on our Gagno Atelier YouTube channel, please don't forget, do us that favor, be such a blessing to us, hit that subscribe button and hit the little, the little bell icon so that you can get notifications when we go live and also when we post a new video. We're trying to post these things once a week, maybe eventually go live once a week also. So be going live and doing a, an actual edited broadcast at least two times a week. So that's our goal, that's where we're going. We've got a lot of great things planned, so hopefully you can be a part. All right, with that said guys, let's go ahead and dive right in um, to what we're talking about. I have a couple mottos in uh, life as an artist that I kinda think are very applicable to the subject of a critique. What I mean by that, first of all, is this. Um, an artist of excellence should always be striving to improve their skills. I think that that's just a vital part of, of just being an artist. You always wanna get better, right? But being an artist of excellence that's taking it to the next step. That is seeking out and striving for ways to get better, to improve your artistic skills, whether it's workshops, classes, binge watching YouTube tutorials, whatever it takes, um, learning and constantly pushing yourself and growing. And so that's what I'm talking about. An artist of excellence should always be striving to improve their skills. Now I have a motto in life that kind of is saying the same thing, but it's in a Tim Gagnon kind of way if you catch my drift. And here's what I say. If I'm the best artist in the room, then I'm in the wrong room. Let me say that again. If I'm the best artist in the room, I'm in the wrong room. And if I find myself in that room, I need to immediately search out a different room, a room where I am the least skilled artist in that room. Because that room is this magical, wonderful place where I'm surrounded by artists that have more experience than me, that have more skill than me, They've been where I am and they know how to help me get to where they are. That's the kind of room that I want to surround myself in. That, those are the kind of artists that I want to be around. And that's what I'm talking about, always striving to improve my skill. So again, check what room you're in and ask yourself, am I the best artist in this room? Am I the worst artist in this room or am I somewhere in between? And as you enter a room here and you get to here, it's time to find a new room. So it's a constant searching out of better rooms to hone your skills in. 
So that's a life model that I have. I've got a friend named Matt Tommy, and he is uh, the leader of an organization called Thriving Christian Artists. If you haven't already, check them out on Facebook. Just type in Thriving Christian Artists on Facebook. He's got a great Facebook group. He has a tremendous ministry uh, that is uh, has a mentoring program, has classes, has workshops. Um, he has a huge conference every year that, that is just phenomenal. So check him out. But he has a quote uh, that he says all the time. And as a Christian artist myself, it's one that's very important to me. What he says is this. We must be skilled and filled or filled and skilled, filled with the Holy Spirit of God and also skilled so that we can accomplish the tasks that God has called us to do. That goes in line with uh, a phrase that you've heard me say here on this uh, vlog many times, Hidor Mitzvah. Hidor Mitzvah is a Jewish tradition that basically means the beautification of the law. I will glorify God by creating beautiful things. And so that's kind of really what it's about. So when it comes to applying those things to a critique, I kind of think of a couple of scriptures pop into my head immediately. The first one is 2 Timothy uh, 2.15. And in a nutshell, what that says is, study to show yourself approved. So think about that. Study, you gotta work hard, you gotta learn, to show yourself approved. You want your work to be something that people go wow over and are blown away by. Everybody, every artist wants to create a masterpiece. But how do you get a masterpiece? You have to be really skilled. So how do you get that skill to create a masterpiece? You have to study. So study to show yourself approved. Uh, and the second one comes from Exodus chapter 31, verses 1 through 5, actually the whole chapter. And the context of that chapter is God is telling Moses to build the tabernacle. And he's telling him very detailed instructions of how he wants the tabernacle to be constructed. And in that, he tells Moses about two master artists that are absolutely phenomenal. And he's telling Moses, go get those guys because they're the ones that are going to build the tabernacle. And so here's what it says. Uh, this is in verse 1 of Exodus 31. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Look, I have specifically chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, grandson of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him... Remember what Matt Tommy says, want to be filled. I have filled him with the Spirit of God, giving him great wisdom, ability, and expertise in all kinds of crafts. He is a master craftsman, expert in working with gold, silver, bronze. He is skilled in engraving and mounting gemstones and in carving wood. He is a master at every craft. So there you go. Not only was Bezalel anointed by God and blessed by God with talent, but he took the time to hone his skills, his God-given talents, and work hard with them until he became a master. You know, I learned something in college uh, when I was first starting at the uh, Academy of Art University, and uh, one of my professors said it. He said, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And that, that has been a life lesson to me, and I've seen it in action. Uh, we had a lot of students in the beginning. They were drawing and painting circles around everybody, and by the time I graduated, they had dropped out because they weren't working that hard, and they started to feel like they weren't that good, and then all of a sudden, they lost their heart, and they quit. Um, so a lot of the people that I went to school with didn't finish. And then in... Uh, my time as an art instructor, I always see these super talented, oh, everybody's freaking out, oh, they're so good, they're so good, they're so good. But when we get into the nitty gritty and we start actually training, they struggle and they have a hard time because the, they're good and that's the problem because they know it and they're lazy. So hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. So that's all applicable to our subject matter today of a critique. You take what God gave you and you develop it and you work hard with it and you learn and you train and you increase your skill level so that your hands can do what your mind and your heart and what maybe God has given you, you can actually make those things and make them well so they don't look like a third grader made them, they look like a professional artist made them. See the point? 
So how do you get from this level to this level? Critiques are a huge part of that. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about that. Um, this is a pretty funny story. Um, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a comic book artist. Oh my gosh, I love comic books. I still love comic books. And one of my comic book art heroes, uh, one of my idols growing up, was an artist by the name of Mark Bagley. And uh, he has been drawing Spider-Man uh, for, shoot, since I was 14 years old. Um, and he's an amazing artist. He has got, He's one of probably the most prolific and most respected artists of probably the last 30 years. I mean, he's just an amazing, amazing artist. I have a lot of respect for him. Um, again, he was my art hero. And when I was getting out of the military, I was about 23, 24 years old. Um, I was trying to break into the comic book industry and I found out I found out, and you gotta understand, this is before the internet. This is before AOL, this is before, you know, you've got mail, this is before all that. I found out that Mark Bagley, this great Spider-Man artist, um, worked for Marvel Comics for so long. Um, I found out that he lived in Atlanta, Georgia, right? So I was like, yeah, I know where he lives. So I got my hands, I live in Panama City Beach, Florida, six hours away. But I got my hands on an Atlanta White Pages phone book. And I searched through the entire letter B section for Bagley. And I found that guy's home telephone number. <laughs> I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I, I tracked the guy down, got his home telephone number. I mean, talk about, talk about Kutzpah, right? So anyway, I called him up. And I explained to him that I was a young artist just starting out, that I'd been in the military, and I asked him if he would critique my work. And I don't know if I impressed him with my, with my tenacity and my kuzpa of tracking him down like that, but he agreed to look at my work. And so I was super excited. This is my idol. Oh my gosh, Mark Bagley is gonna critique my work. So two weeks later, he calls me up and I, and I pick up the phone. I'm like, hello. And he goes, is this Tim Ganyu? I say, yes, it is. He goes, this is Mark Bagley. And I'm not gonna lie. I probably, I, I'm pretty sure I peed a little bit. I was that, <laughs> I was that excited. I was like, oh my God, it's Mark Bagley. So I was like, yes, sir. And then he, he starts to critique my work. And how do I describe this? Um, it was the most brutal, heart crushing, um, harsh, cold, just boom, critique I've ever received in my life. It was the greatest thing that has ever happened to me in, in the art training that I've had over the years. Um, it was brutal. The guy was just, he, he, he didn't just critique each page that I sent him. I sent him like nine or 10 comic book pages. He didn't just critique them by page by page. He critiqued them panel by panel. And there was a catchphrase that he would use. And, and if Mr. Mark Bagley, if you're listening, you'll probably remember this. He would say to me, on panel three, the third panel on the second page, what were you thinking? Oh yeah, you weren't. <laughs> oh my gosh, what were you thinking? Oh yeah, you were not thinking. That's what he said to me. Oh yeah, you weren't. And it was like, just my heart was like, shattered into a bazillion pieces. I was just like, oh, you know, it was horribly brutal. And he was just tearing my work to shreds, pointing out every, I mean, there was literally nothing I did right as far as he was concerned. And I was so crushed. And then he asked me, he goes, how old are you, kid? And I said, I was like 23, 24. And he said, I remember him saying, well, I guess there's still hope for you. I was like, oh, <laughs> so, so then, he proceeded to, to give me a list of books, uh, How to Draw Comics the Marvel Way, the works of Loomis, uh, the works of uh, Hogarth, uh, dynamic figure drawing, things like that, uh, anatomy for the artist, books like that. And he told me to treat each chapter of the book like it was a lesson plan. Don't draw anything except what was in that chapter for like a week and then go to the next chapter. No matter how simple or boring it was, you don't draw anything but that. And again, before the internet. So I had to track, and I lived, Panama City at the time was not like, not very big at all. It was a pretty small town. It was a little beach town. 
and again, couldn't, couldn't go on amazon.com. Amazon.com didn't exist. So I had to go to bookstores and, and ask them to order books for me. And I finally got all the books and then the Loomis books were out of print. So I had to really track those down and uh, it was just, it was a tedious task. But I remember after the critique, when I hung up the phone with him, I had a moment where there was this side of me that was hurt and was in pain and was a little bit angry. Who does that Mark Bagley guy think he is talking to me like that? What a jerk. Whoa. And then there was this side of me and I, I really believe that it was, it was God kind of whispering in my ear. And I remember this side going, exactly, that's Mark Bagley. Marvel Comics trusts Mark Bagley's skill that they let him draw their most important comic book character ever, Spider-Man. And they've let him draw Spider-Man for over 10 to 15 years. And guess what? He's still doing stuff for Marvel Comics and for DC Comics, and he goes back and forth. The guy is the man. So that little voice was like, do you think they'd let just anybody draw Spider-Man? No, they don't let just anybody draw Spider-Man. Only the best of the best get to draw Spider-Man on a regular basis. And they've let Mark Bagley do that for a really long time. Hey, Timmy, maybe you ought to listen to him and maybe he actually knows what he's talking about. And it was like, bing, light bulb moment. And I went, yeah. And so I got all the books and I did what he said every, every chapter, like a lesson plan. I went through it and I went through it and I went through it and it took me months to do it. And you know what I said to myself when I was finished? I looked at the original pages that I had sent him and I said to myself, what were you thinking? Obviously you weren't thinking. Why would you send Mark Bagley those horrible comic book pages? They're terrible. <laughs> so there you go. What was I thinking? I wasn't thinking. I thought I was all that in a box of Popeye's chicken, but the truth is I didn't know what I was talking about. So when you get a critique, I, here I am getting a critique from this guy, but I had that moment, you see? I had this and I had that. And thankfully I chose this because I would not be here today as an artist with a, with a master's of fine art degree, with a thriving career, I'm just loving life. If it wasn't, if I would have not listened to Mark Bagley, my life would have been very different. I really truly believe that with all my heart. So Mr. Mark Bagley, if you're listening, Thank you very, very much from the bottom of my heart. Wouldn't be here without you. So with that said, guys, let's talk about critiques again. Um, one thing about critiques that a lot of people don't seem to understand is when you're giving a critique, that's a high honor. And there's something that happens quite often other artists, and it's usually artists that really aren't that good, to be quite honest, but they're filled with pretentiousness. You know, they think they're all that in a box of chicken and they're, and you know, they're all just, oh yeah, you know, they act all like a big shot. And they will be at an art show or they'll be at a gallery or there'll be something and they'll meet the artist that's putting the show on. Now, that artist has never had a show, but they come and they want to talk and help the artist that's actually having the show and they will critique their work. They'll say, well, you know this, and I think if you would have done this better, this better. That's what we call an unsolicited critique. Now, an unsolicited critique, that's not a critique. That's rude. You're not critiquing them. You're a jerk, <laughs> okay? I'm just gonna say it, okay? You're being a jerk, okay? If the person doesn't ask you to give them a critique, keep your comments to yourself. There's no reason to give an unsolicited critique. 
That's just being rude. So don't do that. That's first and foremost. When artists, uh, younger artists, and when I say young artists, I don't mean age. I mean they're new to uh, creating art. And so uh, they may be a hobbyist level, they may be just a novice artist lesser, or they may be an emerging artist. And they'll be talking uh, with me and they're kind of skating around the issue of asking my opinion or advice. And I'll stop them and I'll be like, are you asking me to critique your artwork? That's stop right now. Let's answer that question. And if they say yes, I don't do it right then. I say, all right. I said, let's set up a time and a place in private and, and we can do that. Um, or email me the artwork and you know the, your references and different things so I can do that. But we do it in private and we do it only with their permission. I, that, that's how I do it and that's the only way I'll ever do it is if I'm asked. If I'm not asked, you will not hear my opinion. <laughs> so, But as an art instructor, I do have to give critiques a lot. And so with that in mind, having had a lot of critiques and given a lot of critiques, these are my points on how to give and receive a critique. So let's start with um, the four P's of giving and receiving a critique. Okay, here we go. The first thing I do if I'm giving a critique, and this is the first thing I believe you should be doing also. Matter of fact, you should be doing this all the time. You ready? Pray. <laughs> the first P of the four P's is pray. And uh, what I mean by that is if I'm giving a critique, I'm going to pray for the person, I'm going to pray for myself, and I'm going to pray for the words. So with praying for the person, I'm going to pray that, that their heart is ready to receive, that they are coachable, teachable, uh, that they're ready to receive a critique, and that their heart and their mind is, is open. So that's the thing there. I pray for myself because I need all the help I can get. <laughs> just me? Raise your hand. That, yep. Yeah, just me. No, I know it's not just me. Um, so you got to pray for yourself too. You know, okay, Lord, don't let me screw this up, you know. Um, because the third thing I pray for is the words. And the reason I say that is Proverbs 18.21 says, The power of life and death is in your tongue. Your tongue can bring death, doom, gloom, calamity, disaster. You can crush someone with your words. Or you can bring healing, correction, wisdom, encouragement, edification, love. You see what I'm saying? So I pray that the words that come out of my mouth will be edifying to the person receiving the critique. The other scripture is Proverbs 12:18. And that says that reckless words wound like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. That's what I want my tongue to do. I want to be real careful with what I say. So I pray for the person, pray for myself, and I pray for the words. That's the first thing I do. The, uh, the second P of the four Ps of a critique is I prepare. And what I mean by that is if you're giving a critique, you better know your craft. And don't be pretentious about it. If you are unsure of your ability, don't give a critique even if they ask. Keep your mouth shut. Just say, no, I'm not really, that's not my thing, blah, 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 okay? If you're going to give a critique, you better know your craft. What I mean by that is you better understand techniques that some people have forgotten or you have forgotten more techniques than most people will ever learn. You know, that you need to be that level of understanding techniques, terminology, you better know the lingo, uh, you better know the history. And finally, you better have the experience and the skill to back up all the other things. Okay, in other words, can you also do it? So if you're giving a critique on figurative painting, do you know anatomy? Do you know the terminology of anatomy? Do you understand, can you actually draw uh, from memory correct anatomy? Things like that, you know, so technique, terminology, history, and the experience and skill to back it up. The next thing you have to do, the third letter P, is you need to present. And what I mean by presenting it is this. You need to be able to articulate your expertise in a manner that the artist can receive and implement to increase their skill level. 
If you're not able to articulate your expertise, you've really got no business giving a critique. You need to be able to explain to the artist what they're doing wrong, but also how to fix it and then some. And if you can't do that, that that's going to be obviously a big problem. So again, the third P is present. You need to articulate your expertise. Okay. The fourth one, I almost did this. The fourth one, the fourth P is project. So we had pray, prepare, present, and now project. You need to project four things. You need to project positivity. Critiques are a good thing. They're not a bad thing. The goal here is to help that artist get better, right? There is not a bad thing in that entire sentence. Nothing. So no matter, just like birth is painful, a critique is painful. It is. But the goal is worth it. Makes the pain all worth it. The end result makes all the pain worth it. So you need to project positivity about the experience. It's going to be great. We're going to have a great time. You're going to love this and you're going to get better. So the next thing you need to project is humility. I mean, let's face it, this person is asking you to critique them. They could have asked anybody, but they asked you. Now that means that they trust you. That means that they trust your judgment. Your opinions matter to them because they had admiration for you. I'm sorry, if that don't humble you, there's something wrong with you. You know what I mean? So you need to project that humility. At the same time, the third thing that you need to project is confidence. Now, wait a minute, you just told me to be humble, now you want me to do confidence. Well, yeah, confidence isn't being an egomaniac, okay? I'm not telling you to act like you're some big shot. I mean, go back to, you know, prepare, you know? You need to know your craft. And if you know your craft, you're going to be confident. You know, if somebody wants me to explain to them uh, what they're doing wrong with their value scales, guess what? I can handle it because I love the value scale and I've taught it and I do it all the time. I make it a regular practice of me to practice my, my, my value scales. I can teach value scales. I can point out someone's problem with their value scale. No problem. I'm confident in that. That doesn't make me an egomaniac. It doesn't make me pretentious. It just means I know what I'm doing, right? So if you're giving a critique, make sure that you project, you project that confident. And the last thing that you need to, that you need to project to the artist that you're giving the critique to is the maestro's heart. Now you go, wait a minute, what do you mean maestro? Maestro is like a conductor or someone like that. Well, in modern terminology, yes. But when you go all the way back to like the Renaissance and stuff, Maestro means master artist. It just means the master. Okay. So maestro, the maestro is during the Renaissance, you had artists that were, you started off as an, as an apprentice, as a young child, like sometimes six years old. And then you would work your way up apprenticing under, under a master artist, a maestro. And then you would become a journeyman artist. And then you would eventually become a master artist. Now amongst the master artists, that's when you were allowed to go start your own atelier. You were start your own workshop. And then you would get apprentices under you and now you're training up that next generation. So having a maestro's heart, if you're giving a critique, is vital because you have a heart to help that other artist to raise them up. So not only do they come to your level, but they exceed your level and they surpass your level. That's your goal if you have a true maestro's heart. Okay? Now, that's how you give a critique. Now, in that, there's some more you know, subtle things. And what I mean by that, more, more um, nuts and bolts articulate. Like when you give a critique, you should kind of make a what I call a critique sandwich. Um, you have positivity on one side of the sandwich. And that's when you start the critique. The first thing you say, point out some nice things about it and be specific. It's very important that you're very particular on what you like about it. Oh, I love the way your atmospheric perspective is really great. That's the first thing I noticed. Or, wow, look at that. The first thing I noticed, your brushwork is just beautiful. Your edge control, uh, it's just really good. Very great job. I really like that. Or you may say your composition or your, 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 your color harmony. 
pick some few things out that really jump out at you as being well done. So that's the, that's the first part of the sandwich, the positivity. And then inside that, the meat and potatoes is having a, um, you know, constructive criticism. And this is the part that kind of hurts, <laughs> you know, but if you use the four P's that we talked about, it shouldn't hurt that much because you're projecting positivity, you're giving them encouragement, you're, 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 you know the terminology, you know, the technique, the history, the experience, skill, you're giving them the tools that they need. You're articulating your expertise in a way that they can understand. So in the constructive criticism part of that critique sandwich, you're giving them the meat and potatoes. Okay, this is an area I see that you, that you need to work on. Now, I think the reason why you're not, that this part isn't working for you is because of X, Y, Z, and how you can fix these things is ABC. And so that gives them hope and it also goes, okay, I'm doing this area wrong. This is how I fix that. This is how I stop doing this. This is how I get better. See, so that's the middle part of the sandwich, the constructive criticism. So positivity here in the beginning, constructive criticism, that's like the hamburg in your hamburger. Um, and then you end that with some more positivity and also tools. So it's, you're really doing good. I appreciate you, you know, coming to a critique and submitting to this. I think that here's a bunch of books that I recommend. Nowadays, you know, when I was getting my first critique, we didn't have the internet, but now my gosh, you can recommend YouTube channels to subscribe to where it's some of the world-class greatest artists in the world living today are, are doing free tutorials on, on YouTube all the time. Um, you've got Google, you've got pages, you've got Facebook groups. There's so many tools that you can recommend to them. So you've got a, you've got a critique sandwich, positive, constructive criticism, positive, bam. Here it is, boom, munch on that. There you go, right? So that's really the, the nuts and bolts of giving a critique. But what about receiving a critique? You know, I wanna tell you um, another critique story uh, that I think applies here. I was attending a church uh, many years ago and this was a big up and coming church. They were pumping out albums. Uh, they were being listened to in radio stations all across the country. I remember being, I live in Panama City, Florida, uh, for those of you just now tuning in, and I was in Pasadena, California, and the radio DJ was going, oh my gosh, you gotta hear these guys, this church is so great, and their music is so incredible, and it was my, my little tiny church in Panama City Beach, Florida, so it was like, wow, you know? Um, and we were putting out these albums, and we had a guitarist that was, he was on the praise team, and he did Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, he was always playing, but when they were making the album, the worship leader kind of approached and said, listen, um, we, we love you, we think you're great, um, we appreciate everything that you do, but on the album, the guitar tracks need to be tighter and you're just not there yet. Um, and so we're gonna go with the studio guitarist at the record company to do the guitar tracks. And what I'm going to do, the worship pastors, I'm gonna work with you and train with you and maybe next album, next year, we'll get you to that point where you can be on the album. And I'm gonna help you and I'm gonna work with you. Now, you remember when I talked about that conversation that I had after Mark Bagley gave me my critique? Well, that guy, he chose instead of taking the opportunity to work with this world-class musician um, to train and grow, he decided to get offended, get his feelings hurt, and leave the church and go to a little tiny church where he was instantly anointed worship pastor. Now, what he did right there was he became a big fish in a small pond. And what that means is this, I don't know how much you know about fishing. Uh, my dad is an avid fisherman. He has been forever. And um, he was one of the few people in our area that had figured out how to catch landlocked salmon. And so it was, a, it was a pretty big deal. People were always like, oh, how do you do that? How do you do that? And he wouldn't tell anybody because, you know, but I watched how he did it because I was there as a young boy watching him. He spent all winter planning 
to catch these fish. Now, here's the roundabout way, what I'm saying. If you don't know what a landlocked salmon is, a landlocked salmon is a salmon that never goes out to the ocean. It's trapped. And what I mean by that is it spawns in river like all salmon do, but instead of going out to the ocean when they're born, they go to a lake. And because the lake is so much smaller than the ocean, landlocked salmon, when they mature, are dramatically smaller than salmon that go out into the ocean. They're big fish in a little pond, but compared to the salmon that go out into the great big ocean, they're tiny little fish. And you see, if you get offended, if you get your feelings hurt, if you, if you let that get in your heart after a critique, you can, and if you fall for the pitfalls of a critique, you will become a big fish in a small pond. You'll, you'll stagnate your growth. So there's some pitfalls to receiving a critique and they have four P's also. They're the same four P's, but they're, but they're implemented a little bit different. So that's what we're gonna talk about right now. So if you are receiving a critique, you need to pray, you need to prepare, you need to present, and you need to project. Now with that in mind, those steps are a little bit different, so pay attention for me. Here we go. When you pray, you pray for the person giving the critique. And what I always pray is, God, use that person to speak into my life as an artist. Use that person. And you know what? God can speak through anybody, whether they're a Christian or not. It doesn't matter. God can use them to speak into your life. And with that in mind, you know, you pray for that person. You say, Lord, use them in a mighty way. And just, Lord, I want to, to be, you know, where they are and, and I need to help to get there. I admire this artist and, and, and I love their work. How can I get from where I am to where they're going? Use them, Lord, to help me get there. There's nothing wrong with that. Pray for that person. Then you also got to pray for yourself. Pray for yourself. Lord, help me to be coachable. Help me to be teachable. Help me to have a coachable and a teachable attitude in my heart. You know, and, and, and that, that's, you know, look up Proverbs chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. You'll see what I mean. Just having that coachable, teachable spirit, that's wisdom. That's wisdom. And, and paying attention to be wise and listen to the counsel of wise people, okay? The next thing you do is prepare. Number two is prepare. Just like it was in, in the how to give a critique, how to receive a critique, number two is prepare, okay? And here's what you have to do as the person getting the critique. Study your craft. Study, practice. Know as much as you can about your craft to the best of your ability. Read books, YouTube channels, Facebook pages, anything you can do, go to workshops, uh, go to classes, do all those things so that you can really, you've studied your craft, okay? Uh, if you have the opportunity to go to school, go to school, study your craft, okay? Next thing is put in the work, put in the work. You, if, you're, if you wanna be a painter, guess what? You gotta paint and you gotta paint a lot. If you wanna be an illustrator, you gotta draw all the time, you gotta draw all the time, okay? If you wanna be a sculptor, man, you better, you better have so much clay under your fingernails from, from sculpting all the time that it's not even funny, you know? You, if you wanna do something, if you wanna play guitar really good, guess what, you need to be playing the guitar every single day. Violin every single day, piano every single day, drums to the point where your parents want to murder you in the night because your drumming drives them insane, okay? You, need to put in the work, okay? Now, the third thing you need to do with preparing for a critique is you've studied your craft, you've put in the work, you need to choose the most appropriate artist to give you that critique. If you're a figurative artist, why are you asking a, an abstract artist to critique your work? That just is dumb, okay? If I'm an abstract artist, why am I asking a portrait artist to critique my work? 
If you're a sculptor, why are you asking an illustrator to critique your work? Okay. Um, that's probably not wise. And so you want to make sure that the person you approach to critique you is at least in the same genre of art as you. I mean, that's just common sense, but you'd be surprised how often that isn't done. Okay. So you need to really like research particular artists before you approach them for getting critiqued. Okay. So that, that's important. And then the fourth thing in preparing is you need to, once you've found an artist that you want, you think it's the most appropriate artist to, to present your work to, you want to prepare a portfolio that kind of fits or meets their submission guidelines. In other words, if they're a portrait artist, send them portraits. If they're a figurative artist, send them figurative paintings. If they're an abstract artist, send them abstract art. Don't put in your portfolio other things. You know, if it's a portrait artist, send him portraits from every different angle imaginable, but don't send him uh, figurative art or don't send him abstract art, just portraits. What genre are they? Make sure your portfolio is based off of that so that they can critique it and critique it well, because that's their area of expertise. So that's just wisdom. That's just wisdom. So, uh, the next thing, the third thing, if you remember, we pray, we prepare, and then we present. And so as an artist being critiqued, you hand the artist mentor your artwork and you submit yourself to the critique. You present it to them. Well, here's the thing. It's a little, it's a subtle thing, but it makes a difference. You ready for it? Dress for the occasion. Dress for the occasion. Um, wear a nice shirt with a collar. I mean, I'm not telling you, you got to be in like suit and tie or in this fancy dress if you're a lady, but you know, dress in a little bit to show them that you're serious about this. You know, if you're showing up in torn up jeans and, 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 and nose piercings and goth makeup and you're all just like, yeah, whatever, yeah, here's my work, you know, and you look like you're going to a funeral, I'm sorry, but that's a bad impression and it shows disrespect to the artist that you are asking to critique your work. Um, dress for the occasion, show respect to the person that, that is, you know, doing that for you. And, and that's Romans chapter 13, verse seven, give honor where honor is due. Pretty simple, right? This person is an artist that you respect. So show them respect, dress for the occasion. If you're, if you're, doing it over the internet, obviously, you know, I mean, but if you're doing like a Facebook live or something like that, Hey, from the waist up, look good from the waist down. You could be in your pajamas, but from the waist up, make sure you look presentable, you know, put your makeup on, do your hair, shave, you know, those things, um, give them honor because honor is due. So that's, that's the first thing you do when you present. And then the next thing, this is a big one. I cannot tell you how many times this happens to me and it drives me bonkers. It really does. And I know it bothers other artists as well. When you give them your portfolio, you put in that portfolio, you present to them only your best work and no excuses and no apologies. Let me tell you what, if I'm looking through a portfolio and I'm thumbing through it and I'm looking through it, right? And this happens all the time. People go, oh, well, uh, on that one, yeah, that, uh, well, this is what happened there and blah, blah, blah. They're making excuses already. And then they're like, oh, well, that one, you know, I'm sorry about that. That shouldn't be in there. That's, you know, I really don't like that one. Well, if you didn't like that picture, why did you put it in the portfolio to show me for a critique? That just brought you zoom, you know what I mean? It's not a good idea to do that. Don't do that. Don't present your best work, no excuses, no apologies. Because if that truly is your best work, number one, you don't need to make any excuses for it. And also, if I'm critiquing your best work, I'm going to cover the areas of your best work, which is also going to cover your not best work. So don't show me your worst work. I want to see your best work. 
No excuses, no apologies. That's my best stuff. Take it or leave it, okay? All right, so that's what you present. And the last thing is, again, project, okay? You need, as the person receiving your critique, project some positivity. You're excited. You're amped. This is I'm getting critiqued by my art hero or my art mentor, and they are going to help me take it to the next level. Yes. All right. You know what I'm saying? This is awesome. This, this is an opportunity to be taken advantage of. So leap at that opportunity and be excited about it. All right. Second thing, humility. Please be humble. <laughs> you know, uh, you asked them to critique your work. So if you've chosen wisely, trust their judgment. Trust their opinions. Yeah, opinions are like belly buttons and everybody's got one. However, the opinion of an expert in their field has more weight to it than just your mother who loves everything you do. You see my point? Now we all love our mamas, but my mama couldn't draw a straight line with a ruler. And that's just the reality of it, okay? But when I'm getting critiqued by one of the artists like a Mark Bagley, and he's critiquing my, my, my uh, comic book pencils, he knows a heck of a lot more about that than my Uncle Joe. See the point? Trust their judgment and trust them because you've done your homework and you've chosen your critiquer wisely. So trust it. And the last thing that you need to project, this is you projecting to the artist that is critiquing you. You need to project to them an attitude that you are coachable and teachable, okay? That's really important. If they feel, if they're getting that vibe from you that you're, you're, you're amped, you're excited, you're coachable, you're teachable, you're ready to learn, you're ready to be sharpened, give it to me, don't hold nothing back, I'm taking notes, I'm excited, I am ready for this. Let me tell you something. That is every art instructor's dream student and that is anybody that's ever given a critique, they enjoy giving critiques to people like that. Because once again, what did my old professor say? Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. You give me a coachable, teachable, and amped up, ready to go, driven student, I'll take that over the super talented oh, guy any day of the week. Because after, after a couple months or a year or more with the first kind of student, they will surpass the super talented one every single time. Now you throw in, you've got talent and you've got drive and coachability. Sky's the limit. Sky is the limit. So with that said, how to give a critique, how to receive a critique. Four Ps, pray, prepare, present, project. You do those four things and I promise you the experience of getting a critique will be absolutely amazing. You will grow as an artist, you will grow as a person, and your skill level will skyrocket every single time. All right guys, hey, Thanks for listening. Remember, if you're watching us on Facebook, like our page, Gagno Atelier, like that page. If you are, and share it like crazy to all your friends, somebody can see it. If you're watching us on YouTube, on the Gagno Atelier YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button for me and hit the little bell to be alerted of when we post new videos or go live. I would really appreciate that. I wanna have like eight gajillion subscribers on um, YouTube, that would be great. We got a lot of great uh, subjects coming up, a lot of videos. If you like this one, please let us know. And remember one thing, as always, God loves you and so does your old pal Tim. We will see you next time.